We never really know what might become the outcome of our struggles. We don't have a crystal ball which allows us to see into the future. And where are we in the year 2017? We're certainly not at that point where we thought we would be. I always like to say that um, the promises of struggles in the past that were not fulfilled in the past should constitute agendas for the future. So we're still challenging racism. We're still um, uh, attempting to purge the world of sexism and misogyny. We're still standing up against capitalism. Uh, and, and I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing that the struggle continues, that it moves from one generation to the next. Racism um, is at the very center of the history of the United States of America. There is no uh, way to conceive of the history of North America uh, without attending to uh, the genocidal colonization mm -hmm. of indigenous people, without attending to slavery, which uh, both was the consequence of and helped to produce a kind of um, structural racism that has uh, remained uh, the very core of the United States of America. Europe used to imagine itself as immune from the problems of racism. And I know here in Italy, uh, with uh, the emergence of uh, the forms of uh, migration that brought uh, ever larger numbers of, of people from the global south, uh, and particularly from Africa to Italy, racism erupted. Uh, um, and I, I, I don't know whether I should say erupted, because uh, colonization, colonization uh, uh, was grounded in racism. And, and so it seems to me that what Europe is experiencing now is precisely the consequence of that history and the failure to address that history. The racism that we are addressing today is a direct consequence of colonization. And Europe now is um, reaping the results of its history. Uh, there was this proclamation of the post-racial era that was supposed to have uh, been um, introduced by the election of Barack Obama. Uh, to many people, it meant that if a black person could finally be elected to office in the United States of America, then something about the entire world would have to change. Now, we weren't right about that uh, because nothing really substantively changed. The United States is still capitalist. It's still imperialist. It's still racist. So structurally, things didn't change. But at the same time, I think that Obama could have uh, used his office uh, uh, in a way that might have been more progressive. Uh, uh, to express support does not mean that one has to uh, 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 forego all manner of critique. And believe me, now that Trump is in the White House, we could certainly use someone like Barack Obama. The, the Trump administration is really attempting to turn back the clock. Uh, 
make America great again, which I always say, he's trying to say make America white again. I mean, that's, that's really what that means. The majority of people in the US did not vote for Donald Trump. And we have to continue to point this out. We have this obsolete system that's called the Electoral College. And the Electoral College is an institution that was created during slavery that was designed to permit southern states with small white populations but large black populations to gain political leverage. So we can say that Donald Trump was elected because of slavery, because of the continued um, persistence of racism. Trump's election happened because of a lot of ideological subterfuge. As a matter of fact, he, he was able to persuade many of the uh, poor white people, uh, working class white people, who really should be standing together with people of color who are suffering the impact of global capitalism uh, because the fact that their jobs have been lost as a result of the migration of, 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 of corporations uh, to the global south and to parts of the world where labor is cheaper, and this is how Trump made his billions, if he really has billions, but this is how he made his money. Uh, and then he appeals to these people to support him because he says he's going to bring jobs back to the United States. Uh, I like to see this moment as a, a, a moment of a great deal of confusion, uh, particularly, uh, well, Trump, Trump is confused. He does not know what he's doing anyway. Uh, I mean, the challenge of this moment is precisely to move beyond that history of, 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 of the Confederacy, uh, of the Ku Klux Klan, of the state violence uh, that is represented by uh, the continued uh, killings of black people and Latinos and, and Muslims uh, by uh, the police and other state agencies. And also, I'll add, and the connection with intimate violence, because we know that when we speak a great deal of, about violence, we often assume that it's, it's men who are the targets of violence, but actually all over the world, women are the most consistent targets of violence. And there is a connection between intimate violence and state violence. And so what I find really exciting about this period is that young people know how to make those connections uh, and are creating a kind of consciousness that represents um, the possible um, uh, future of our planet. Thank you. But I don't think we should uh, underestimate the the possibilities of fascism. And it's not the old fascism. Uh, and, you know, nothing ever reappears in history in exactly the same way. Uh, uh, and, you know, just as here in Italy, uh, people were, were really shocked uh, when Berlusconi was elected. Uh, now I remember that. Uh, and you're still suffering the consequences today. Um, uh, there was this sense in the U.S. that that all of the all of the work against racism had substantially transformed uh, the country, uh, and then, of course, uh, it was as a result of the Obama administration, or, or in part a result of the uh, the fact that uh, the notion of a future without racism uh, was constantly raised, uh, was constantly evoked, uh, and it was so clear, uh, as we saw 
all of the men and, and women and trans uh, uh, women especially, transgender women who were uh, killed by the police. And so it seems to me that that contradiction uh, helped to produce the current movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, uh, the movement in solidarity uh, with migrants and, and, and immigrants in the, in the U.S., uh, the, the, the movement in solidarity uh, with uh, uh, Muslims, the anti-Islamophobic uh, uh, movement, the movement against anti-Semitism, uh, uh, the connections between Black Lives Matter and Palestinian solidarity. I think it is absolutely important to continue to insist on challenging the kind of individualism that is promoted by neoliberalism. And I'm not saying individuality. Indiv individualism uh, destroys um, individual potential, destroys individuality. Uh, and collectivity um, nurtures uh, individuality. That, I think, is the real challenge of, of, of this era. And I think that um, anti-racist struggles, feminist struggles, uh, struggles uh, in solidarity um, with, uh, with migrants, uh, immigrants in the US, uh, um, struggles in solidarity with Palestine, uh, Black Lives Matter struggles, all of these struggles have to engage in uh, the task of cultivating um, uh, a sense of collective community that will bring us all together. So I think this, the kind of uh, united front that was, um, that was once um, raised as the strategy to defeat fascism. You know, women do most of the work. Uh, I mean, this is still the case, isn't it? In, in, in activist movements, women, women do the work. This has always been true. Uh, during the civil rights era, women did most of the work, but whose names do you know? Martin Luther King and others, but anyway, we won't, uh, we won't do that whole history. But um, so I was in this organization and we had this struggle over the, the place of women because we were aware, this, where, this was in the 1960s, we were aware that women were doing the work. And then when it came time for there to be a press conference or a public rally, the men would always take the stand. And the women said, no. We didn't call ourselves feminists. But what was interesting, and this is a lesson that I have retained to this day, not all of the women said no. And not all of the men were opposed to women assuming a position of equality in the organization. Uh, there were women who, who felt that women should do the educational roles, the domestic roles, and so forth. And then there were men who uh, absolutely supported the right of women to be the spokespersons of the organization. This is, this is the era in which women all over the world are on the rise. This is an era in which we're not only seeing the rise of women, but we're challenging binary notions of gender, and we recognize that the very category women no longer means what it used to, to mean. Uh, um, it used to be the categorical woman used to be a white middle class woman, uh, a um, Hillary Clinton, um, so to speak. And, and now we're recognizing that we have to um, blow open, explode the categories. Uh, and we're seeing really exciting uh, developments everywhere. So I'm, I am really excited about the ways in which feminisms 
uh, and especially radical um, anti-capitalist, anti-racist feminisms uh, have helped to shape this new notion of what kind of uh, movement we need uh, during this period. Hillary Clinton was subscribing to a form of feminism that has effectively become obsolete among radical feminists. Her um, glass ceiling feminism, and she constantly evoked this metaphor of trying to penetrate the glass ceiling. And of course, the glass ceiling feminism indicates a hierarchy in which you're already at the very top, and all you have to do is penetrate the ceiling. You know, what about those who are at the bottom? For a very long time, uh, there have been those who have argued uh, that, um, that struggles around gender also have to involve struggles around race and struggles around class and struggles around sexuality, that, that gender never exists abstractly. It is always race. Uh, gender is always class. Uh, uh, and, and so the development of a strain of feminism that insists on uh, thinking together these categories that are so often pulled apart uh, uh, and, 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 and recognizing that the consequences for struggle are that uh, feminists always have to be involved in anti-racist struggle. I think that uh, there is a, a, a feminism, a grassroots feminism, um, an anti-racist feminism, um, uh, uh, a feminism that insists on acknowledging the broadening of the very category women, uh, that includes both cisgender and transgender women. Um, and this is the feminism that is inspiring not only young women, but young men as well. Uh, and uh, this is why I was saying earlier that I'm really excited about this period. Uh, as, as much as uh, we have to deplore about the current moment, there is a great deal to be excited about it. And the emergence of this radical feminism is something that uh, uh, is really helping me um, you know, maintain my vision of the future. <laughs>